Today's Cribs has an epic feel. A man who is redefining what it is to go big. John Paisano. Is he in? Hey, hey John, how are you doing? Good. You're right. Welcome. Thanks Come so on. much for having us. Come on. <gasps> this is a wonderful space. Yeah, thank you. How long have you been here? Just over almost two years now. Right. I used to be much further away from home. Right. In downtown LA. As you know, driving around in Los Angeles could take a long I used to drive an hour and 40 minutes to work every day. And I said, I had two kids, and I was like, the hell with that. Yeah. I'm getting closer to home. So I moved towards the water, and here I am now here. So. And when building a space like this, what is your kind of, I, I imagine you've worked at several different facilities and stuff. What is your kind of, okay, now I'm not going to do that. You know, what is your kind of criteria? Well, I wanted, you know, the big thing for me was comfortable. Right. You know, I wanted to feel like, it, I didn't want it to feel like it was a music studio. I wanted it to feel like it was a living room, like it yes. was a, a room in a home where it was warm, where you could sit down and put your feet up and feel comfortable. I mean, you know, what we, we work with directors and producers. Yeah. I want them to come in. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to be able to tell me how great my music is. 90% yeah, yeah. of the time they don't. <laughs> they give me a bunch of notes, but I, I just wanted to, I wanted it to be set up for comfort. You know, I wanted it to be more of a, more of a viewing room than a, a, a studio. You know, sometimes studios can feel really cold. They have, you know, mixing boards, and sure. you know, speakers. And I didn't want it to be so centralized around that stuff. I wanted to, you know, more about furniture and tables yeah. and wood and books and the piano, you know. <laughs> and, and so that was kind of the goal of it. It's not one of those studios that you walk in and you feel like your ears are being sucked through your nostrils. You know, right. it's, got, it's got an ambience to it. Yeah, know? I mean, all of that was what kind of went into to making it. And, the, you know, the other thing too, I wanted it to, I, you know, I do a lot of, I work in a lot of different genres, whether, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, video games, feature films, television, whether, you know, episodic network stuff to now the subscription-based stuff, Netflix, they're all different. They all require different workflows. They require different amounts of people that are working on the team for them. All the schedules are all over the place. So I needed to also have a space that I could grow a little bit, have a couple other, you know, writers and assistants with me here as well. So the way that we, the way that I created the space, and we'll, I'll take you through it, is when I, when I created it and built it, I didn't want to dedicate space for a recording space. Right. Um, but I still do re do some recording here. So the way that I did it was I built a lot of writing rooms, mm -hmm. but I made each room modular, meaning that we can record in here, but have a control room be in the other room. And we use the TVs and cameras to communicate oh, in each brilliant. room with the players. So at any moment, I can turn this space into a live room and then go over in Braden's room and record from in there and communicate with players in here and vice versa and vice versa. So everything's wired into this central machine room in here. Right. And from here we can patch and do whatever we need to do. The first thing I notice is, is just a, a solitary pair of speakers. Yeah. D do you work in 5.1? Do you mix well, I got the, I actually have the rears. Oh yes, you do. Sorry. And I have a sub. I used to have a center and then I got the ATCs and I was like, I'm not buying another center channel <laughs> <laughs> to throw dialogue through or just yeah. a reverb return into my center. Yeah. So I do, I work in quad. Okay. Um, and I work in quad mostly because of you guys <laughs> creating all these great sample libraries with all the mic positions <laughs> and everything. So I couldn't get away with just doing stereo. I really don't mind working in stereo in the mock-up phase. Sometimes it's a little bit with the amount um, with the amount of stems sometimes that I have to deliver, and even now we're delivering stems to, even for our mock-ups, we're delivering stems to the editing bay. Yeah. For a lot of directors that I work with, you know, younger guys, they aren't afraid to work with 5-1 stems or, or quad stems, and they want to be able to um, have control over stuff in their Avid. And so sometimes they say, oh, can you deliver us, you know, 10 stems or, or whatever now? So we, we, we kind of have to do it sometimes. So sometimes working in stereo makes it a little bit more manageable. Quad is, is great because it's your, your stereo at the front, you don't get in the way of dialogue, nothing in the LFE, and then you've got your yeah. nice... The only thing I do miss about my center channel is that I used to love throwing my dialogue through it. Of course. You know, it just gets it out, especially when I'm doing playbacks with directors and all these things, whether it's quad or 5.1 or, or the technical side of all this stuff is so important when it comes to, um, you know, getting all these things happening. 
Now, you mentioned you love to work with musicians and under most circumstances will work with live musicians. Do you tend to completely swap out your, your sample content with what the live players play or is it a, a mixture of the both? I use everything. Right. I, I mean, you know... So what do samples bring and what do the musicians bring in your mind? Well, samples bring control. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 I have such control with samples that um, control and choices. You know, the great thing about MIDI is that um, I'm able to program in a line and then I'm able to swap out a bunch of different feels, a bunch of different tones, textures, ideas, mic positions, mm -hmm. um, playing styles, techniques. But the MIDI still all stays the same. I might have to adjust some volume curves and some things like that, but it gives me so many choices to, um, you know, to, to, to put up against that programming and, and put up against picture and, and see what's working. You know, recording a player is linear. You know, you record them and what you record is, is what you get. Sure, you can have them try different things and do different, but time is money and we're on budgets and you only have a certain amount of time to grab what you need to get. Mm -hmm. um, so to be able to have that time to really experiment with the samples is is huge. I mean that's that's one aspect of it. You know, there's there's obviously that that side of it. The other side that samples bring, um, there's a size to samples yeah. that I think is really hard to attain um, that players can give you. Yeah. There's you know especially like when it comes to things like brass and winds and and things of that nature, um, choir. Those are physical instruments to play. Yeah. You know, the human voice or blowing through a bunch of metal yeah. <laughs> and wood. And you know, these are physical things that have to happen. So when if I wanna if I'm doing a, a, a huge brass melody and it's got a huge, you know, five seconds sustain at the end of it in a chimbasso. Yeah, <laughs> lowest high. Yeah, the, you know the lowest mean? note at the highest dynamic. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? It might be unrealistic, but hey, that's the sound I'm going for. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's that's what it is. The orchestra to me is just another color in my palette. It's not the final color for me, especially the scores I write. You know, I'm, um, I kind of came up as a traditional writer, um, but. Um, this is this is what I grew up writing on was sure. all this stuff. I mean, when I was when I came into this business, it was um, early two thousands, late nineties, early two like right around two thousand. I got to LA, um, and the sample libraries. I was going I, when I was submitting reels on projects. I was going up against guys who had budgets and they were recording live music, and I had to figure out a way to make my mock-ups sound as good as some of the live stuff. And that was the only way I could try to compete with people. So I just worked really, really hard on trying to figure out a way to make all these libraries sound good. Why do you so still enjoy working with the live players? What does that bring? Oh, the hu I mean, the human, the, 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 the human interpretation of music. I mean, I, I, you know, I can give a string part to three different players and they all have their own interpretation of how that part plays, whether how they're leaning into an attack or how they're releasing it. How do they, you know, how do they, their vibrato, their, um, it's very personal, you know, you don't, you know, when we do, you, we try to capture, I think, as much as that as we can with sample libraries. But th every day, every time a player reattacks a note, for instance, on a scoring session, it's just a little bit different. And all those little kind of imperfections, if you will, um, you know, add to a performance, you know. And, and, and I think that type of stuff um, is, is really hard to figure out a way to have a computer okay. retrig it. I, it's, you know, who knows what the future brings, but. Um, let's hope that we never get to a point where that gets replaced. No, I see sampling as an interface between yeah, the two, and I, I see too. them as different. You know, sampling, you can do the impossible, but for me, I don't know. I think with, with a lot of students, there's a lot of an analysis of the sound, the theory, the technique, but I think people shouldn't be analysing the sound, they should be analysing how it makes you feel. Yeah. And that's that's indescribable, you know. Yeah. This, this said, I, I I knew someone who said samples will put the hairs up on your your arms. Yeah, live players will make you cry. Right. That, that being the difference, really. Yeah. yeah, no, it's true. I mean, that's a that's a great analogy. It's a um, it's it's almost indescribable. I think what humans bring to music. Uh, the one thing, it's just different. You know, I mean, it really is. It's 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 a magical experience. I mean, it's every single time I do a scoring session, um, 
it's like, you know, I grew up playing sports a lot and I, I remember, you know, before a big football game, you would you would have this energy and this yes. excitement and that's how I feel before scoring sessions. And it would never get old, you know, and, and you always, it's a, it's it truly is a magical experience. I mean, especially being a film composer. I mean, I love being on the stage when that director finally gets to hear that score being played for the first time. It's one of the greatest parts of being a film composer is watching that kind of experience. And it's all because of the players, you know? It's all because of the, the, the players kind of bringing all that stuff to life. But when I'm writing with samples, I'm writing with the intention that this stuff's not going away. Um, we're just gonna make it better. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that you, you mentioned about the kind of the fear factor with directors. You know, you can't make these things sound too different, you know? No. Because it, when it hits the dubbing theater, yeah. it can send them into a blind panic. Oh, yeah. When I they mean, go, great this, point. Is, this isn't what I yeah. you know, signed off on. Yeah, know? and the beauty of it is too, and I think too, good mock-ups bring safety to the studios. Like, if I brought a studio in here and I played them, you know, kind of a shitty mock-up, mm -hmm. and my name wasn't Hans, which is not, yeah. <laughs> and Hans does incredible mock-ups. Absolutely. He's probably a bad example to use. But... John Williams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, if I, my, my name doesn't carry the same weight, obviously, as some of those guys. So I have to... Pref I, this has to sound great, because that makes them feel good. And that allows them to give me a big chunk of money to go and record a live session. Excellent. So it all kind of works with, together, you know? Um, and that's the other things that samples do. They, they allow... They allow the, the director, the producers, the studio executives to hear what's gonna happen on that scoring stage. And that's huge, I mean, that's invaluable because that makes the scoring session very enjoyable for to me. Because when I go to that scoring session, nothing crazy is gonna pop up. They aren't all of a sudden gonna hear a cue and go, whoa, like, what is going on here? They've already heard it, they've already given me notes on it, they've already seen it to picture. Everyone goes to that stage and there's this kind of, atmospheric, it's just light and fun, and unless the film's in major, pro, you know, in trouble yes. or something, then I've been on those too. But I mean, for the most part, um, when we show up on that stage, it's everyone's having a good time and, and everyone kind of knows what they're getting. So I really enjoy, I, I really take good care of my mock-ups for that reason as well, because when I get to that stage, I wanna know that they're happy and they know what they're getting and the you know it's all about the client and, and making and I think a lot of people don't realize that about this business. It's it's an art, but at the same time too, it is a business. Yes. You know, these people are making movies, they're making lots of money with them. They're spending they're, lots of money. They're, they're spending lots of money on them. They're selling them, you know, the, the soundtracks of business. I mean everything about it has a monetary component to it. Um, and it truly is a business and and we just gotta make sure that that process is also kind of looked after and, and taken care of, so. Well, should we talk about your process? So yeah. what, what are you, uh, you've got two screens here. That, is it two different computers or? Okay, so. No, three screens, right. Back in the day, I'll, I'll give you my kind of rundown here, because I've, I've recently changed up my whole entire workflow. I used to use a multi-system where I would have one DAW rig and then I would have a bunch of sample rigs. Yeah. You know, gigas. Yeah, gigas, or and then it was they turned into Viennas. Mm -hmm. um, and I would kind of have, you know, one per section of the orchestra, and then, you know, they would just get bigger and bigger as more libraries came out. And as computers got stronger and stronger, I started realizing, I, I just got to the point where I hated, I my whole thing was more computers, more headaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One would go down, I'd have to shut down my session, figure out the problem, troubleshoot it, and you know how it is in our business, time is money, yeah. and we're always under crazy deadlines, and you know, you're down for an hour, it could be brutal. Yeah. Um, so I got really tired of, I kept trying to find a way to shrink my system, and- Did you also find that it, may, it may renders you totally reliant on here, being here. You have to be here with all of your setup. You can't take yeah, that anywhere I mean, else. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely part of it. I mean, that was, that was part of it, although, there is a component of me too that I do, I don't have like a, like a room in my house. Okay. I like being here, when I'm here, I'm working, when I'm at home, yeah. I'm at home. I kind of have this like, you know, strict division between church and state, yeah. <laughs> so, to, so to speak. So, um, so what I did is I started researching, what's our biggest limitation, RAM, mm -hmm. right? The reason why we need all these computers because it's all about voice count and loading things into RAM. And with the invention of solid state drives and and fiber and all this stuff, the drive situation became less 
of an issue. Um, then it all became about RAM. So I started looking into these computers that could load mass amounts of RAM in them, these HP workstations, they're called Z stations, Z840s. You could load up to two terabytes of RAM Whoa. into a computer. Now these computers are meant for you know, doing high floating point computation stuff in the oil industry, running satellites, um, doing all these. They weren't really made for music. Um, but I wanted to figure out a way, how do I get all of these samples into one system? Mm -hmm. um, and so I looked into these computers and I talked to some people over at HP and I said, have you know, have you guys been using any of this stuff? And I actually first noticed them. I did a, I do a show for DreamWorks, um, How to Train Your Dragon. It's a series for them. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that at, at, at DreamWorks, all these computers, they were using all these HP computers and all their animation departments. And I was like, what are all these Z stations? And so I, I looked into them and I, and I found out about them. And yeah, they were these computers that you could that they were workstation class computers, servers basically. But yeah, so you could load, they run on these Xeon processors and you could just load a ton of RAM into them. And they're all um, ECC equipment, error correcting equipment, because like when you're running satellites, you can't have computers just crashing sure. on you. You know, so yeah. they're very stable computers. Now, you know, a software might crash, but the computer never goes down. I mean, this, I've had my computer running now, I think for like two years, it hasn't even, froze up on me. It's just been solid. Wow. It's just been up and running. And a matter of fact, I think a lot of times that's how they suggest you run them. Um, so I got these computers. I loaded them up with RAM. And I think I have around, I don't know, 600 gigs of RAM in them or something. Fuck. And I, I can load two terabytes if I want. It's, it's expensive. Insane. And the cool thing is I lease the computer like you would a car. Okay. They're expensive computers, yeah. but you can like lease them like you would, like a three-year lease, like you would on an automobile or something. And I, that's how I started. So I moved everything internal. Okay. So my whole entire palette now is all internal, one computer. I open up Cubase and everything's there for me. And I'll show you, I normally don't start off with my template like this, but like you can see all my libraries are all loaded. Wow. And so what I do is I keep them loaded like this, but instead of having everything activated, I deactivate all the tracks so I don't open my session and everything's just loading forever. Yeah, it yeah. would take like 15 minutes to open the template if I had yeah. you know, that much stuff loaded. And that's one of the downsides of having. The upside to it is everything, on its, everything is on its own track. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to take a giant you know, Valhalla reverb and throw it on my French horns, yeah. I can do it. And it doesn't affect my French horn bus. You know what I mean? So having that you know, having that control over every single track separate is huge for me. The big thing for me, and I'm, I'm sure that many people haven't experienced this, again, going through that little dance that we've got to do with directors, is when you're doing run-throughs mm -hmm. with these slave systems, yeah. is if you don't have the MIDI information oh, that you pull yeah. up a queue and it doesn't sound like how yeah. you saved it down, yeah. with it being internal, it comes up identical every All the time. time. Yeah. I mean, that... And I've t I take that for granted now, but yeah. that was one of the biggest, that was the other thing too, because there's nothing worse than ripping up a key like that, playing it back, and the strings are really loud. And it drives me crazy. And I got to a point where I just started printing everything before yeah, they would come over yeah. and put it in Pro Tools. But yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you, you have the confidence now to do all that. But having that separation is, is one of the other things that's really great. So the way that I normally start off in my template now, and this is a cool little feature of Cubase. I'm, Logic might have this now too, I can't remember. Because I used to be a Logic guy and I switched over to Cubase a couple years ago. What was the reason for that, to, to switch um, to PC? That was one of them. I mean, that's, that's I switched actually while I was on Mac first. I'm like, I am constantly switching. <laughs> You're a switcher. I am, I mean, I, I, I love technology. Yeah. I'm always looking for shortcuts. I'm always looking to see who's, you know, what's, oh, Pro Tools has retrospective recording now. Oh, I wonder if I can record in Pro Tools now. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm, I, I'm kind of, and it drives my assistants crazy. <laughs> you know, they think I'm a nutbag because of it. Guys, we're going to Reaper. I'm the guy <laughs> who, like, an update comes out, and I do it in the middle no, of a project. No, you're you know, not that guy. Yeah, I am. Wow. Yeah, so I'm brave. <laughs> um, so, but normally when I start, normally when I start off my sessions, I do it like this. Nothing. Ah. Uh. I used to work in these giant templates, and what would happen is I found that I would always come in, and I would always go to my mutes, and then I would yeah. go to my foot tondo. I would just and then make the same shapes. I would do the same thing over and over again. And now when I'm like this, it forces me to look at a scene and go like, well, what it, what should I do here? And like, what do I hear? You know what I mean? Bef and 
you do this long enough, you develop muscle memory mm -hmm. to just go to the same stuff and go to the same sound and go to the, and now I found that, now my orchestral palette is always pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, that's why I don't have things in my template like Evos and like I, those are things that are experimental to me mm -hmm. that, the orchestra is almost now like the last thing I think of when I start writing stuff. I'm always thinking of like Omnisphere patches or, you know, um, Enigma patches, just like any crazy sound or library or, or thing that is gonna like give me some inspiration to start a sequence. And then the orchestra usually starts making its way in. As now sometimes I start off with the orchestra depending on what the film is or what the score is. Um, but I like starting with a blank palette because it kind of forces me into this creative space. So I'm interested, so you're running everything internally in, 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 in your, um, in, in Cubase. I do slave my video. There's okay. a great, a really cool program called Video Slave. Okay. That I use. And um, I used to run a separate Pro Tools rig over here. Right. And all my, and I used to use the system where all my channels would run into Pro Tools and Pro Tools would kind of act as a hardware mixer. Yeah. Um, but these days now, with the way computers are, and now that you can run Pro Tools native and all this stuff, I just, when I'm done in Cubase with the queue, I just export all my tracks and then bring them into a Pro Tools session and deliver them. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't do like the live bounce in real time thing okay. anymore and hosting my video. So I just spit MIDI time code to this program. It's called Video Slave. Okay. It's a really cool program. You can, um, you can have like, I could have a hundred different videos in here. Oh, great. And depending on what your time code is, it will switch automatically to videos. So like I don't have to like if I open up a new session and it's some queue that's in reel two, it yeah. will automatically go to that reel. Amazing. And then when you you're working, you've done say uh, one and ten that kind of bleeds into one m eleven. Do you put one and ten in there so you can hear it or? You can. Yeah, you can do that. Or else I'll bring it into here. Oh, I see. You know what I mean? Like I'll either bring it into Cubase or whatever. You know, if I if I'm trying to figure out if there's like a, a, a some sort of handshake that needs to happen. I'll do, I mean, it's all kind of fluid. It, it, it all depends on, you know, um, is it easier over here? Is it, I really, this is mostly just for picture. I do run my dialogue and uh, like visual, like sound, sorry, sound effects and temp track through here and you have control over that stuff and you can mute them and unmute them. The other really cool thing about this program is you can create um, streamers and hit points. Wow. So if I wanted to create, like let's say I had a hit right here or something that I wanted to put a, uh, a streamer on and I want I know that it's gonna go right there and I want it to last for five seconds I can put it there and so now like when it's you know when it's when it's playing along here yeah. do you have a preferred uh, reverb that you use for orchestral <sighs> right now I'm using a lot of the exponential audio internal stuff um, the biggest reason why is because I, I was I used to use hardware reverbs but because we're doing a lot of stem printouts I need to open up a lot of them per yeah. stems so I started using a lot of internal and the exponential Phoenix verb is one I use okay. and the R2 are kind of my two reverbs choice. If I had endless amounts of, uh, if it was like IO and I would have, you know, Bercassis lined up and lexicons and I still, but like I said, we don't really mix here. No. So I leave all that expense to my mixers. <laughs> so they can, they can spend all the money on that stuff. I don't need to. So yeah, so for the most part, I'm just using internal. I think that's reverbs. something that's nice about this room is it's not kind of, crawling with tech you know it's just yeah. it's just it feels like a writing space to well me. i was talking about earlier you just don't need as much now like no. than you used to back no. in the day you needed so much stuff and now with native doing this thing it's so nice with the like remember you said you know the osc stuff and all like i just all the touch screen stuff it's like and now that the libraries are all kind of going into this world, it's so nice to have all these like little knobs and it's just very clean. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big clean person. Think, well also, you know, the, the difficulty I have with all of my synths everywhere yeah. is that you look at it and you go, I've got too much choice. So I'm just, I stay in the, but I think what's nice about, again, you talking about this liquid process and these guys might, might not be on your desk next year, yeah. is it's like, I'm gonna use this. I wanted one mono and I wanted one poly. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I wanted one polyphonic synth, one monophonic synth. Um, I might get other ones, but I might never have more than two up. Yeah. It's yeah, two's kind of like my breaking point. <laughs> It's yeah. interesting, the Sub 37, I've heard really good things about that. It's great, yeah. it's great, and they have a cool, it has a really cool interface for it. 
um, that kind of interfaces with it from the sequencer. So it's kind of like, it's vintage, but at the same time too, you have some, you know, recall on these things is always the most difficult thing. Working, course, yeah. you get a director over here and you spend all day doing this thing and he says, oh, it's great, but can we tweak this? And then before you know it, you're trying to figure out how the Absolutely. hell you recreate it. So it, it, in our world, now if you're doing like an album or stuff, these things are much more friendly to use, but in our world, it, it's, you know, we're at the whim of, it's not about what we want for no. these movies. It's all about what, you know, six or seven other people want. So we constantly have to, I always tell people, I'm like, well, you know, I'm a cabinet maker. People come in and they tell me what type of cabinet they want and what color they want it and what type of hardware they want yes. on it. And we build it for them. And it's we be rigid and- Yeah, and, we, and we try to say, you might want this color, but this yeah. definitely goes way better with your wall color. <laughs> the recallability is a, is a key factor because it's yeah. not just, okay, well, you just print it and that's fine. Yeah. Because, you know, one M09, one M10, one M11, they might remove, cut out one M10, yeah. and one M09 and one M11 are a semitone apart. Yeah. It's like you're, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the novation, I just, I mean, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this one can sound like 30 different synths. I mean, it's really, it's really powerful. It sounds incredible. Um, and it's polyphonic, you know. I mean, having a polyphonic synth in a piece of and hardware it's got is great. Oscillators from Oxford, whatever oh, yeah. that means. <laughs> I mean, it's it really is. I mean, it does sound amazing, though. It really. I have to check that out. I've not yeah. seen that before. Um, it's one of their. It's one. It's one of Novation's newer ones. So, um, and it's they're they're all USB, which is nice. So they kind of have they kind of blend into this world. I, I had a profit last year. Um, it was almost like too vintage. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't even like figure out a way to like work it into my workflow. It was just like take too much time for me to deal with and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I, I look at guys like Tom or like Junkie and stuff and like watch these guys work. It's just, I'm just not from that yeah. era. You know what I mean? So I kind of, these are a little bit more friendly to me. But Should yeah, we have a look yeah let me take Great. you through. Wow. So then like, so basically what we did here is all the rooms kind of are all wired into this room. And it's so funny now, because we do, we do. Could you imagine like a machine room from like 15 years ago? It would be like, with all the console. I mean, this is kind of it. It's like a couple, here's my computer, you know, it's like one computer, you know, it's, you know, 600 gigs of RAM in it. Yeah. Um, but it's, you just don't need a lot anymore. But like, yeah, everything kind of is coming in through um, RJ45 cables and patch bay. And then what we want is we have these floor boxes that connect with Elcos in every single one That's of the rooms. Amazing. So at any moment, like I said, we could take Braden's room, could be used as a recording space. We could record players in here, um, be in my room monitoring the recording session in here and communicating and vice versa. Sure. If we wanted to you know, use my room instead, um, we could, and then there's actually a third room over here that's also wired in as well. So it kind of gives us this modular, uh, you know, capabilities of of, of being That's able right. to not really have a dedicated recording space, but still allows us to kind of have some flexibility when it comes to that stuff. Because at the end of the day, it's all about kind of maximizing for writing. And the goal when we set out to build the place was never really to make it a, a pure recording facility. Gotcha. Um, Thanks for your time. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then we have like a third room over here. This is Roger. Sorry to interrupt, Roger. I'm hey, Christian. Hey, hey. How are you doing? Just you turn it off the key, so perfect. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so this is Roger's room. So this is a third room, and then again, same kind of setup with the Elko. And even though we could record in here, we never would, because Roger probably wouldn't let us. Yeah. Roger's, Roger's an avid rock climber. Every time and then we'll come in, he'll be climbing on the side of his wall over here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's just another third room, another writing room. Um, they're all kind of, um, Braden's, Actually, I have not come to think of it, we're all PC-based. Yeah. Yeah, there was a point where, where Roger was the only PC-based guy in here, and now we actually have all gone to the dark side. I <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah, so, but, but all the rooms are more or less um, kind of replicas of each other. We all kind of use the same setup, same template, same DAW, and then we just have our common area. Oh, it's so lovely. Yeah. We've got a really nice setup. 